In 1969, Sam and Mary Bauman ran a machine shop out of Sulphur Springs, Texas, in which they serviced trucks of all sizes. Like any full-service shop, a good portion of their repair work dealt with traditional torch welding. While this served its purpose, it also came with the issue of spatter, deformation, cracks, and slag inclusions, just to name a few. These were all issues even the best welder will face from time to time. We'll come back to our story in a bit, but at this point, let's talk a bit about torch welding. Now generally, torch welding, or sometimes referred to as oxyacetylene welding, is a process that relies on the combustion of oxygen and acetylene. When mixed together in correct proportions with a handheld torch or blowpipe, a relatively hot flame is produced, which can reach temperatures of 3200 degrees Celsius or 5700 degrees Fahrenheit. The chemical action of the oxyacetylene flame can be then adjusted by changing the ratio of the volume of oxygen to acetylene. With this form of welding, three distinct flame settings are used, neutral, oxidizing, and carburizing. Welding is generally carried out using the neutral flame setting, which utilizes a balanced ratio of oxygen and acetylene. The oxidizing flame is created by increasing just the oxygen flow rate, while the carburizing flame is achieved by increasing acetylene flow in relation to oxygen flow. Because steel melts at a temperature above 1,500 degrees Celsius or 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, the mixture of oxygen and acetylene is used as it is the only gas combination with enough heat to weld steel. However, other gases such as propane, hydrogen, and coal gas can be used for joining lower melting point non-ferrous metals and for brazing and silver soldering. Oxyacetylene equipment is portable and easy to use. It comprises oxygen and acetylene gases stored under pressure in steel tanks. The tanks themselves are fitted with regulators and flexible hoses which lead to the blowpipe. Specially designed safety devices such as flame traps are fitted between the hose and the cylinder regulators. The flame trap prevents flames generated by a flashback from reaching the cylinders. The principal cause of flashbacks are the failure to purge the hoses and overheating of the blowpipe nozzle. Now on to the downsides. When welding, the operator must wear protective clothing and tinted colored goggles. As the flame is less intense than arc welding and very little UV is emitted, general purpose tinted goggles provide sufficient protection. Also, it's probably a good idea to wear protective respiratory equipment since metals can and will vaporize and off-gassing becomes a threat. Now back to the original story. Frustrated with his approach, Sam Bondman knew there was a better way and realized an opportunity to create a product that could cold weld and replace traditional torch welding. Subsequently, he invested his own time and money working with a Texas A&M chemist and eventually formulated a tougher than steel two-part epoxy and named it JB Weld. The JB Weld company was then founded. Initially, Sam and Mary sold their new product out of their car direct to automotive shops and jobbers across Texas. But it wasn't until the product caught on and would eventually be sold in stores throughout the US and internationally. In 2008, the company was purchased by a group of private investors led by CEO Chip Hansen and since have expanded the product lines through innovation. In just a few years time, JB Weld has broadened the product line to meet the changing needs of its demand, including new adhesives for metal, wood, plastic, and general purpose use. Some of these innovations include epoxy putty sticks, syringe-based epoxy adhesives, thread lockers, and specialty products that continue to provide the world's strongest bond for most repair projects. On a personal level, I found myself using epoxy putty sticks with great success for a lot of automotive projects. At this point, Let's pivot and talk about how two-part epoxy works exactly. But for the sake of simplicity, we're going to keep it pretty high level. Generally, two-part epoxy works by combining an epoxy resin and a hardener in equal amounts. The term equal amounts is important because the reaction between the two happens when the ratio is one to one. Technically, the hardener does not work as a catalyst, but rather as a component of the reaction. Essentially, it gets consumed in the reaction itself. Moreover, the epoxy resin, also known as polyepoxides, are a class of reactive prepolymers and polymers, which themselves contain epoxide groups. Collectively, the epoxide functional group is also where the word epoxy derives from. An epoxide is very reactive and is composed of a three-membered ring, 
Epoxides are very reactive to nucleophiles, which cause the ring to open. Now, a nucleophile is an atom in a chemical that is rich in electron density and is attracted to a positive charge. The following is a simplified example of an epoxide resin with an epoxide functional group on either end. Epoxide resins can vary in structure and the differences will impact the epoxy's properties such as strength, cure time, and appearance. The structure of epoxy resins and their hardeners are often proprietary and covered by patents, which is why our explanation is not so much of a one-size-fits-all. The amine chemical above that is labeled B is the hardener and two-part epoxy. It usually contains a primary amine as the nucleophile. Primary amines will have a nitrogen atom and two hydrogens connected to them followed by a carbon chain. The hardener will often contain two nucleophiles per molecule. In our case, B has two primary amines. A hardener with two nucleophiles can cross-link two molecules of resin. One nucleophile reacts with one epoxide per molecule. The product of the cross-linking can continue with another molecule of B because it has available epoxides remaining. This is what leads to the polymerization or chain forming process. In some instances, a hardener contains a primary amine, but it only has one amine per molecule. The primary amine B can react with one molecule of A to give C, which contains a secondary amine. It's important to know that a secondary amine will only have one hydrogen atom connected to it. Additionally, secondary amines are also capable of reacting with epoxides and will give D in the example below. Now, the problem with secondary amines is that the nitrogen will be more crowded, and this can slow down its reaction with another molecule of A, and slow down the curing process. This is known as steric hindrance. Now, I hope this simplified explanation casts some light on how the two-part epoxy works, and you appreciate the chemistry the next time you find yourself using JB Well for a project.